Year Three, Part Two. The first day of November came when Judy must pack. It was mild and calm and sunny, but there had been hard frost the night before, for the first time, and the garden had suffered. Pat hated to look at her flowers. The nasturtiums were positively indecent. She realized that the summer was over at last. Judy's trunk was in the middle of the kitchen floor. Pat helped her pack. Don't forget the black bottle, Judy, Sid said slyly as he passed. Judy ignored this, but she brought down her book of useful knowledge. I must be taking this, Patsy. There do be a lot of etiquette hints in it. Or do you be thinking they're a bit trifle out of date? The book is by way of being a bit oldish. I wouldn't want my cousins in Ireland to be thinking I didn't know the latest rules. And Patsy Darland, I'm taking me old dress up dress as well as the new one. I did be always loving that dress. The new one is real fine, but I haven't been wearing it long enough to fail acquainted with it. Do you remember how you always hated to give up any of your old clothes, Patsy? And Patsy, dear, here's the key of me blue chest. I'm wanting you to keep it for me when I'm gone, and if anything but good should be happening to me over there, not that I'm thinking it will, you'll be finding me bit of a wheel in the baking powder to can in the till. Judy, just imagine it. This time next week you'll be in the middle of the Atlantic. Patsy, dear, Judy said soberly, there's a favor I'd be asking you. Will you be saying that little hymn every night when you say your prayers? The one where it does be mentioning those in peril on the sea. I'd be a real comfort to me on the bounden deep. Well, my trunk's packed, thank the good man above. Sure, and I knew a woman that took four trunks with her when she went to the old country. I'm not knowing how she stood it. Everything to be ready, but what if something'll be preventing me from going at the last minute, Patsy? I'm that built up on it, I couldn't be standing it. Nothing will happen to prevent you, Judy. You'll have a splendid trip and a lovely visit with all your cousins. I'm hoping it, girl, dear, but I've been seeing so many disappointments in life, and Patsy did. Keep an eye on Gentleman Tom, will ya? And see that Mrs. Puddle Duck don't be imposing on him. I'm not knowing how the poor beast will be doing without me. Don't worry, J.D. I'll look after him. If he doesn't go and disappear as he did the last time you were away from home. Pat lingered a little while that evening on the back stair landing, looking out of the round window. There was a promise of gathering storm. A peevish wind was tormenting the boughs of the aspen poplar. Scudding clouds seemed to sweep the tips of the silver birches. Soon the rain would be falling on the dark autumn fields. But even a wild, wet night like this would have been delightful at Silverbush if her heart had been lighter. Judy would be gone by this time tomorrow night, and Mrs. Puddle Duck would be reigning in her stead. No Judy to come home to. No Judy to give you little bites. No Judy to stir pea soup. No Judy to slip in on cold nights with the aider gown puff on the poet's bed. And what, said gentleman Tom on the step above, is a poor cat to do? Long Alec took Judy to the station next morning through a drizzling rain. She was going to Summerside to spend the night at Uncle Brian's and take the boat train with the Pattersons the next day. Everybody stood at the gate and waved her off, smiling gallantly till the car was out of sight. Pat turned back to the kitchen, where Mrs. Puddle Duck was already making a cake and looking quite at home. I hate her, thought Pat, wildly and unjustly. Dinner the first meal without Judy was a sorry affair. The soup of Mrs. Puddle Duck was not the soup of Judy Plum. She doesn't know how to stir the brew, Tilly Tuck whispered to Pat. Ray came home that night, but supper was a gloomy affair. Mrs. Puddle Duck's cake, 
in spite of her domestic short course, rather looked as if somebody had sat down on it. Long Alec was very silent. Tilly Tuck went straight to his granary roost as soon as the meal was over. Nothing pleased him, and he did not pretend to be pleased. "'I feel old, Pat, as old as Methuselah,' said Ray drearily, as they peeped into the kitchen before going to bed. "'I feel middle-aged, which is far worse,' moaned Pat. Mrs. Puddle Duck was sitting there, knitting complacently at a sweater. No cat was in sight, not even Gentleman Tom. "'I wish I could be a cat for a little while, just to bite you,' whispered Ray to the fat back of the unconscious Mrs. Puddle Duck, who really was quite undeserving of all this hatred, and in fact, though quite highly of herself for helping the gardeners out, while Judy Plum was gallivanting off to Ireland. Saturday was dark and dour, but a pleasant letter from Hilary helped Pat through the forenoon. Dear Hilary, what letters he could write! Hilary, as a friend, even in faraway Toronto, was worth all the bows in the Maritimes. In mid-afternoon it began to rain again, battering everything down in the desolate garden. Tilly Tuck and Mrs. Puddle Duck were already at loggerheads, because when she complained that Just Dog had barked all night, he had indulged in one of his silent fits of laughter, and said blandly, "'If you told me he'd purred, I'd have been more surprised.' Sid took the girls over to the bay shore to help Winnie paper a room. The air was as full of flying leaves as of rain, and floods ran muddily down the gutters of the road. It was just as bad when they returned at night. I suppose Judy's on board ship now. They were to sail from Halifax at five o'clock, sighed Ray. There's Tilly Tuck playing his fiddle. How can he have the heart? "'but I suppose he's trying to get on the good side of Mrs. Puddle Duck. "'That man has no soul above snacks.' "'I don't know how we'll ever get through the winter,' said Pat. "'They ran up the wet walk and opened the kitchen door, "'then stood on the threshold, literally paralyzed with amazement. "'Tilly Tuck's fiddle was purring under his hands.' Mother was mending by the table, whereon was a huge plateful of fat doughnuts. Long Alec lay on the sofa, snoozing blissfully with Squidunk on his chest, and Bold and Bad, and Popka curled up at his feet. Gentleman Tom, with the air of a cat making up his mind to forgive somebody, was sitting on the rug, with his tail stretched out uncompromisingly behind him. And Judy, Judy! in her old drugget dress, was sitting beside the stove, stirring the contents of a savory pot. Her knitting was on her lap, and she looked like anything but a heartbroken woman. For a moment the girls stared at her unbelievingly. Then, with a shriek of, Judy! They hurled themselves upon her. Wet as they were, she hugged them with a fierce tenderness. Judy! Judy! Darling! But why? Why? I just couldn't be going. That do be all, me jewels. I was knowing it in my heart as soon as I left. Poor Alec hadn't a word to throw to a dog. You could have been scraping the blue mould off of him be the time we got to the station. But thinks I to myself, I'd look like a nice fool backing out now, after all them presents, thinks I. So I did be sticking it out till I got into my bed at your Uncle Brian's that night. The second best spare room it was. Oh, oh, they treated me fine. I'll be saying that for them. But never the wink would I be sleeping. I kept thinking of me kitchen here, with Mrs. Puddle Duck reigning in me stead, and all of the things that might be happening to me, roaming abroad, running into an iceberg maybe, or maybe dying over there. Not that I'd be minding the dying so much, but being buried amongst strangers. And then, if anything but good should be happening to some of ye here, thinks I, perhaps they'll be learning to like Mrs. Puddle Duck better than me, and her as smooth as cream. I could see ye all snug and cosy, with the bows slipping in along the dim, thinks I. There do be all of the turkeys to be fattened for Christmas, 
and the winter hooking to be done, and maybe Joe coming home to be married. And I couldn't be standing it. So at breakfast, I up and told Brian I'd been after changing my mind, and I'd just be going back to Silverbush instead of to Ireland with the Pattersons. Judy, you said the other day it would break your heart if anything prevented you from going. Oh, oh, yesterday and today be two different things, said Judy complacently. When you thought I was all excited over my trip, I was just talking to keep my spirits up. It's the happy woman I am to think I'll sleep in my own snug bed tonight with Gentleman Tom curled up at my feet. Brian brought me home this afternoon, and when I stepped over the threshold of my kitchen, I wouldn't have called the Queen my cousin. Oh, oh, you should have been seeing Madame Puddleduck's face. I thought this was how it would be, says she, as spiteful as a fairy that had just got a spanking. Judy, where is Mrs. Puddleduck? Safe back at the bridge where she belongs. Sure, and she wasn't for staying long when she saw me back. Oh, oh, she'll be saying plenty besides her prayers tonight. I went into the pantry thinking I'd see fine things in the ways of Sunday baking, what with her domestic short course and all. But all I did be saying was a cake looking like nothing on earth and a pie with a lot of hen tracks on it. Tilly Tuck tells me he did be eating a piece of it and never will his stomach be the same again. Oh, oh, domestic science, says I. I did be putting it in the pig's pail and frying up a big batch of doughnuts. Praise the sea, but keep on land is a good proverb, symbolically speaking, said Tilly Tuck, after which he ate nine doughnuts. Everybody was shamelessly glad and showed it, much to Judy's secret delight and relief. They shut out the rain and the cold wind. Never had the old kitchen held a more contented, more congenial bunch of people. Grief and loneliness had gone where old moons go, and even King William looked jubilant in his never-ending passage of the Boyne. Outside it might be a dank and streaming November night, but here was the eternal summer of the heart. Isn't it nice to look out into a storm? said Ray. Listen to that wind roaring. I love it. Judy, I'm glad you're not on the Atlantic. I do be just where I want to be, Cuttles, darling, and feeling real high and hilarious. Sure, and I do be good friends with Silver Bush again. It's been looking at me reproachful-like for a long time. I'm knowing now I could never be leaving it. It's got into the marrow of me. So here I am, with enough fine clothes to do me for the rest of my life, and all the fun of getting ready. Oh, oh, twill be a stirring tale, the story of how Judy Plum went to Ireland and got back so quick she met herself going. Now we'll begin planning a bit for Christmas. Judy crept in that night to see if the girls were warm. The darling, thoughtful old thing. You're such a dependable old sport, Judy said a drowsy pat, sitting up and hugging her. It seems unbelievably lovely that you're here, here, and not far away on the billow. Judy was not acquainted with Wilson MacDonald's couplet, for this is wealth to know my foot's returning is always music to a friend of mine. But she felt that she was a very rich woman with only one small cloud on her perfect joy. Patsy Darlint, do you think I ought to be given them back? The presents, I mean. Certainly not, Judy. They were given to you, and they are yours. Judy gave a sigh of relief. It's real glad I am to hear you say so, Patsy. It would have been bitter hard to give up that elegant toilet set. But I'm thinking I'll give your Aunt Edith's hug me tight back to her. Never will I let her be saying I come be it under false pretenses. Just as a great wave of sleep was breaking over Pat, a sad premonitory thought drifted across her mind. And yet, for all she didn't go, I feel as if things were going to change. <laughs>